This video is sponsored by Keeps. <sighs> Another day in the happy world of YouTube. I wonder how everyone's been doing since I dropped my last video. Oh well. If it makes you feel any better, uh, I love the ending? It seems that my experience with the Chimera Ants arc is that of pretty low lows and astronomical highs. I'm not gonna spoil anything, but this one's an absolute doozy. So sit back and relax as I drown my sorrows in an abyss of Togashi's twisted cruel creation. Here are my thoughts on the ending of the Chimera Ants arc. Arito, Last week, many of you expressed concern that I didn't expand on Meruem that much in my video. This was by design. The material I'm covering today and this climax really centers around Gon and Meruem as well as their dynamic, primarily exploring the human condition and deconstructing those concepts to hold a mirror up to us, mankind. And naturally, the Chimera King himself plays a leading role in this endeavor. So let's dive in. As I've mentioned throughout this story, Gon has always been a positive beacon with small but ever-present instances of darkness, culminating in the most visceral almost murder of the series after Morel's challenge to the young boy in order to prove himself. And in my last video, I expressed my delight over how this one-time joyful character, due to the circumstances he's endured and currently is experiencing, is contorted and twisted into becoming one of the scariest and most fully realized characters of the series. I've mentioned the conflicted look painted across Gon's face in the last video, but what I didn't mention was how he sat. Ironically, or appropriately, this is very much a hunter staring down his prey. Like a coiled trap, he is waiting for the moment to strike, sort of like a snake in the S position. You just know it's a matter of time, if anything goes wrong, if the slightest upset or disturbance occurs, Pito and Komogi will meet their end. This is a kid on the edge, and as we've seen earlier, this state of mind makes him an extremely dangerous individual. And you can see that visually on Pito's face too, as they frantically try to figure out what to do in this increasingly tense and dangerous situation. And really, this is where we're picking up from the last video. Pito trying to heal Komogi, Gon staring daggers through Pito. In these scenes, Gon is short with everyone, even Killua, who feels as though he's losing his best friend right now. Up until this point, this was my favorite part of the story, as it forced me to contend with the new reality. Gon isn't the carefree kid he appears to be. A darkness that seems to be bubbling more and more often to the surface is making itself known right now, and it's seemingly on full display. I think what makes Meruem interesting is that he's undergoing the exact opposite change Gon is. While Gon is embracing, or in some ways being overtaken by a darker tendency, Meruem started out rather conventionally evil in a sense, thanks to the encouragement of his subordinates or more primal instincts, but slowly over the course of the story he gains a deeper appreciation for certain humans thanks to the interactions and games he shared with Komogi, and thus his devotion and will to protect her makes sense. They're complicated, informal, and messy relationship in this story is the most beautiful aspect of it without question. Which honestly is fitting as these scenes progress nicely onto one of the more brutal and ugly battles in the series. Meruem versus Natero. As a quick aside, I really like how visually Togashi has decided to communicate how serious Natero is taking this battle. He's cut his hair and beard while opting to wear much more physically practical clothing. This helps without words to communicate how serious he's taking this and, from what we can discern, how he anticipates the fight to go. Last week, I expressed all of my issues with this arc and so I don't really feel the need to repeat myself right now in that department. However, if there's one interesting application or element the narration added to this story that I I personally enjoyed and didn't mention last week was to do with Meruem and Gon's characterization and development throughout the arc. Narration is used in a number of instances to communicate how conflicted or troubled Meruem is and with Gon, there's nothing. No narration forcing us to focus exclusively on that hatred and anger his expressions bear. And so if I was trying to express what this arc was trying to say in its simplest form, I'd have to say humanity and the themes involved therein. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And in pursuing that theme, I thought this arc did a superb job. And you know what else is interesting? The lack of actual fighting in this arc. I now understand why some of you were upset that I didn't spend more time discussing A, B, or C fight in the prior videos because those 
those are actually some of the biggest fights in the arc outside of Natera versus Meruem. I mean, I was full on predicting so, so many more grandiose battles to take place here, but again, that's me thinking that this is a traditional shonen, when in reality, it's not. With the biggest fight in question, Meruem versus Natero, for the majority of the action, not even really being a fight, given Meruem's desire to talk and not come to blows. The visuals, on the other hand, for that fight were... Awesome! Game to see Natera go all out to the best of his ability against this foe we've come to learn as being all but invincible was exciting, but again, how the story frames this encounter takes center stage instead. Once again, this fight takes place not to necessarily settle a fight between two fighters, but instead to humanize Meruem and to, in an interesting turn of events, highlight instances where Natero's ego and pride might cloud his judgment. Not massive moments, but moments here and there where he'd be ticked off by how composed Meruem is taking his greatest efforts. Given that he himself has lived his life as an uncontested number one, perhaps this is a metaphor for mankind's arrogance in asserting that they themselves are the only species worthy of moral consideration in these matters. But anyway, the action outside of the battle here is spectacular. And so while the action is spectacular, the reality is that this entire section of the story and arc is essentially a space for Tagashi to muse over certain philosophical questions. And so if for no other reason than to see him pontificate over these dilemmas, I recommend checking out this story story. Natero is there to kill the Chimera and King, and the Chimera and King is there initially to buy time for Komogi to heal, which is an altruistic goal, and eventually to learn his name from Natero, who is holding that information hostage, baiting him into a confrontation. Natero resorting to those sort of tactics to make Meruem attack once again humanizes the ants and in a way lowers mankind's standing, which will be a running theme in this story in one way or another. This is the best fight in the series, I think. Both of these people are stand-ins for their individual races in this battle that could very well decide the future of the human race and as we become increasingly concerned for, the Chimera Ants. Made all the more effective as during this fight, I personally became much more interested and sympathetic towards Meruem and looked on as Natero, through his own desire to defeat Meruem, whittles himself away down to the bone. A once great hunter who, by the end of this encounter, starts to look like a monster in his own right. And I think that's specifically what this arc succeeds in doing. And just as well, seeing as this is pretty much what it's primarily trying to do. Now, if I know my audience, and I do. Most of you guys out there are around the age where male pattern baldness sort of becomes a looming threat on the horizon. I mean, this thing affects two out of every three people by the time you're 35. And once it's gone, it's gone. So the best way to prevent this from happening is to keep your hair. And this is what Keeps is all about. If you pick up a subscription, you'll gain access to their 24 seven team of licensed doctors who will review your situation and recommend the best possible treatment to meet your personal needs. And once you're good to go, you'll gain access to their range of hair strengthening products all delivered to your door every three months. And the best part is that it's all very affordable but does not come at the cost of quality. Keeps offers the generic versions of FDA approved hair loss medications so you have access to high quality products without all that branded markup. Treatments typically take around four to six months before results start to show, so if you're already running into issues, it's important to act quickly. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, head over to keeps.com slash notmark or click on the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. Again, that's keeps.com slash notmark. Act now and it's more hair you have a chance to save. Advance carefully, but swiftly. Now, something I didn't touch on much of in the last video were the side characters, and while I didn't connect with many of them, for reasons I tried to communicate last week, I thought Nov was a standout. Not necessarily because I connected with him on any personal level as a character, but because I really liked what the character offered the narrative from an anticipation standpoint. From the beginning, both himself, Natero, and Morel have been the senior hunters assigned to this issue, and of the three, Nov seemed to be the most composed and stoic of the trio. That is, until...
Another trend I've alluded to in this story time and time again over the course of these reviews has been the sheer determination Togashi has expelled to make this story perhaps one of the most unshonen issues in Shonen Jump. If Togashi has a character that needs to overcome something, quite often they will be faced with the cold hard dose of reality. And in the case of Nov, that exact choice was made. Taking the most composed character and after exposing him to the power of the Chimera Ants, changes him into a quivering, scared heap of a human being. And honestly, I thought that choice was brilliant. It helps to get him over as brave, but moreover, every subsequent time he rears his head in this story, we're reminded just how frightening and dangerous these ants are, with Nov's demeanor and facade changing dramatically over the course of its runtime. Such is the gritty reality that Hunter x Hunter basks unabashedly within, placing characters that otherwise would be perfect fits for other more traditional shonen stories where they would no doubt find success and save the day, but in this story, as an audience, we are forced to watch these characters characters squirm and struggle in this much more unforgiving, realistic world. And at times, particularly during this material, while great, I did find it to be very upsetting. Earlier this week, I found myself reflecting on what it is I like about this story, and while I did like a lot of the decisions made in it, and while it succeeds in making me feel the way it wanted me to feel, I found myself sort of nihilistic and melancholic by the end of it. That's not to say that's a bad thing for a story to make me contemplate, but speaking as someone that is that way sort of naturally, I was kind of waiting for an uplifting moment or some glimmer of hope during this material that, perhaps fittingly, never came. So yeah, for the last week after watching the largely negative fallout from the prior video's criticisms, I also got to bask in the emotional turmoil that this arc's finale efficiently administered my way. And that's not even to mention this arc's strongest part, Killua's desperate struggle to save Gon, his best friend, from himself, and the manner with which this excruciating pain is communicated both narratively and visually. Now, I touch on the darkness and negativity surrounding this arc, and really, it's at its peak during Gon's sections. Personally, I think what makes these scenes with Gon so effective is how it integrates aspects of his character we know are there, which honestly translates to a truly authentic negative depiction of him. This vengeful, resentful, angry, and hateful young man we see stand before us is every bit as much himself as the joyous and happy version we've previously seen. Elements like his value system, his determination, his intelligence, and his his acute instincts color every choice and movement he makes and every short but to the point piece of dialogue he utters. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is what makes Gon so effective in this role and what makes me feel uneasy watching him during this material is the fact that I still recognize everything he does as true to his character. This arc deconstructs what humanity is and Gon plays his role in telling that story too and he shows all the worst parts of himself yielding utterly terrifying results. But not before the absolute worst parts of humanity start to show themselves to us and the Chimera Ants for all to see. As the battle between Natero and Meruem rages on, Natero continues to lose limb after limb, forcing and contorting his body to ignore the issues and damage he clearly has while charging forward with the same gusto he had been before. This was particularly tough to read through and the illustrations in this portion of the material are some of the most gruesome looking and harrowing of the franchise. However, when it becomes obvious how outmatched Natero is, when his time is limited, despite Meruem's desire not to engage further after already being forced into this situation, to cap off the occasion, Natero unleashes perhaps the greatest evil humanity has at its disposal. If there ever was a visual that captured the horror that mankind can unleash on the world, it's this specific panel. And in viewing it, it sends shivers right through my body. This is, in my opinion, the most powerful moment of the arc, and in a single panel, it said so, so much more than I was anticipating. And in order to explain why this visual hits me as hard as it does, I need to talk about... Godzilla. Yeah, the giant atomic breath breathing lizard guy. Yeah, him. For those of you that don't know much about Godzilla, long before the giant kaiju monster movies of today and long before the abomination Hollywood produced in the 90s, That's a lot of fish. Godzilla was a film made in Japan and released in 1954 originally. Looking back at it now, the effects can be seen as somewhat dated, what with the man in a giant rubber costume knocking over boxes disguised as buildings. But the interesting part comes when you read into its history. The very end of World War II was marked by two giant explosions in Japan. While Germany and Hitler are still very much part of 
the global zeitgeist to this day, the atrocities and war crimes that Japan committed across Asia during that time period cannot be understated. And in an effort to bring about a quick end to the war, the United States bombed Hiroshima on August 6th, 1945. And unfortunately, thinking that this was a bluff of sorts, Japan refused still to yield, forcing the United States to bomb Nagasaki on August 9th, just a few days later, leading to their ultimate surrender. Despite trying to save lives in the long run and the horror that the Japanese inflicted across the Eastern world, the graphic imagery that came from those horrific actions are still very much ingrained in not just Japan's history, but all of our collective minds in one form or another. And with almost 200,000 casualties across the country, most of which are civilians, it's a snapshot that captures the true horror of war and really, humanity. After Japan surrendered and the US occupied the country for years after, any film that would speak of the horrors that were seen in the aftermath of those two explosions would be disallowed or discontinued. And while there are films today that more directly deal with Japan's side of the conflict, like Grave of the Fireflies, the first that slipped through the cracks was 1954's Godzilla. Godzilla was supposed to represent the atomic bomb that was dropped on Japan in monster form. And interestingly, the version of the film that eventually reached US shores later had parts cut out and new footage filmed to insert an American main character to make the film appear here more neutral. But in short, this massive mushroom cloud in Hunter x Hunter, used by mankind in an effort to stop an opposing force, is perhaps the most emotionally evocative depiction of resistance and attack Togashi could possibly have thought of to cap off this fight for supremacy. And if there was a single chapter that I thought summed up the philosophical debate succinctly, I'd choose chapter 288. In it, Meruem describes his issues with the current proposal to fight and outlines his newfound desire to not bring harm to those that are defenseless. He criticizes the current order and outright refuses to fight Natero because he doesn't want to hurt an individual that he believes can bring good to the world. And on the other hand, in that same chapter, we hear the point of view of those that enlisted the services of Natero to take care of this problem. Problem. With their take on the matter standing in direct contrast with the Chimera Kings, they simply want to eradicate the species from the face of the earth, not seeing themselves the hypocrisy in annihilating an intelligent and, as we've seen, sympathetic species. This by no means justifies what Meruem has done or was planning to do, but it's definitely more grey than the black and white issue initially proposed to Natero. It's a fascinating discussion and deconstruction that's explored with words and not actions. However, this next scene, there are quite a few actions, and let me tell you, they do all the talking. From the very beginning of the story, as early as the second episode, we've been shown fleeting but increasingly frequent glimpses of this young boy's mindset, and this right here is the culmination of his disastrous approach. I really like Gon, and for me, he was the most interesting part of this arc. Not because the other aspects and characters aren't fleshed out as much as they can be, I mean, they are, but I've spent so much more time with the likes of Gon and Killua that really I was heavily invested in what they were doing primarily. Having finished healing Komogi and now faced with what state Kite is left in, Pito has no option left but to attack. The direction this scene takes is such an interesting one and a welcome one. As an audience, in this case, we're in a somewhat unique situation in that we totally understand where Gon's mindset is given our history with the character, and when it comes to Pito, we've been privy with their thoughts the entire time Komogi was being healed. We're fully aware of what both characters are capable of, and Togashi uses our knowledge to create an uneasiness around Gon's character. Having been explained to him why Kite can't come back, he labels Pito a liar. Now, we know Pito isn't a liar, but this verbalized thought really helps us understand the delusion Gon is trapped within. The poor child only sees red. The anime's version of this encounter is equally spectacular. Heightened by the musical score, the subtle delivery by Gon's voice actor, and the dark aura flowing around and engulfing the young man. He's truly lost in his own rage, and there's nothing good that comes from that, except for perhaps the best chapter in the manga. Since the beginning of it, Togashi, during moments of high drama, has elected to use an extremely inky stroke, for lack of a better term, and this chapter demonstrating Gon's sacrifice of his own life to obtain enough aura to kill Pito is one of the most visually amazing manga chapters I've ever seen. 
It's so bold and dynamic with some of the most harrowing imagery imaginable. Captured spectacularly, might I add, in the anime during the transformation sequence. And really, these scenes are hard to watch as Gon very much has resigned himself to death. And even after having achieved what he set out to do in killing Pito, Killua is once again forced into harm's way to protect his best friend from throwing his own life away. And in almost doing so, loses his arm. I don't even know what to say to that. And it's around this time we get to see the most narratively complex choice made by Tagashi, I think. And one that naturally creates a lot of tension in a believable way. Compounded by character and plot, so here it is. Kamugi is with Pam after Killua dropped her off to go get Gon. They're gone for pretty much the rest of the story, so you can forget about them for now. Meruem is just about brought back from the brink, and with himself being mostly composed of elements from his subordinates like Poof, he's suffering memory loss. And seeing this, Poof, who has always thought Kamugi was a bad influence on the king, takes this as an opportunity to kill her. It creates spectacularly effective tension, and it's made all the more tense as we learn the Chimera King can feel his emotional state, but also loves games so he plays along. As an audience we understand that the king gets really good at these games really fast so again the tension rises once more. And really that narrative dynamic was for me the most effective and potent part of this material. It all makes sense and feels true to all of the characters while involving most of the cast in a believable way. I mean this involves even Gon to a certain extent as he's the one who disposes of Pito, the individual Poof ultimately searches for. And with the king using his end and terrifying speed to find those in hiding it's a fun little sequence of scenes that I did enjoy quite a lot, offering Pam ample opportunity to fully realize herself as a character. Having started off at the beginning of this arc as the demonic comedic character she was, by the time this story ends, both on a visual and narrative level, she becomes much more humanized. And speaking of humanized, while I didn't like Octopus Man all that much and found his scenes pretty boring, I mean, come on, do you really need a narrator to use the elevator? <laughs> You know what? Never mind. While I didn't like him that much for my own independent reasons, I did like Welfin's scene with Meruem. Watching as he inadvertently reminds Meruem of Kamugi, and watching as the poor fella is put the fear of God into, was both shocking and reminiscent of Nov's experience somewhat, with both exhibiting significant changes to their physical appearance as a result. But I mean, in the case of Welfin, I think he lost a lot more out of the deal considering how old he looked by the end of things. As things progressed towards the ending of the story, a few things became immediately evident. The king's losing more and more soldiers, he realizes that he's been poisoned by the explosion from the tarot, and I realize that this story is one of tremendous tragedy with very, very few bright spots. Whether that be Yuppie's eventual death and discovery, or possibly the most emotional and sad moment of the entire series, Meruem's last moments with Kamugi. There are choices made when you're a mangaka in how best to serve a scene visually. What is the best way you can communicate a particularly powerful moment or scene? And in my opinion, Meruem's death does just that. It's perfect. Leaving nothing but black panels and text to communicate what's happening, this choice creates for me a quiet scene with two individuals bonded through something deeply significant to them, all the while our attention is focused on exactly what they're saying. The black panels creating a sense that Meruem has his eyes closed and is slowly drifting away. With the final panel revealing the ultimate gut punch, Komugi embracing Meruem. I don't think it's at all unreasonable to assert that Meruem is the strongest of all the new characters introduced for this arc. He's complicated, drives the plot forward, and moreover was interesting to see make choices and interact with other older characters. Watching this creature thought to be a monster become much more human than many of the actual humans in this series felt incredibly cathartic and interesting to explore, all the while our most human characters become very much the monsters that they were fighting. And while this arc delivered for me an experience I wasn't expecting, it did deliver some tremendous consequences that I'm sure will be felt from this moment on. Like Kite's death, Gon's emotional break, and perhaps most significantly, the loss of Gon's youth or Nen. And Natero, knowing that there was a very real chance that he might not return from this encounter with Meruem, left a last will and testament of sorts. A resignation and an announcement of a contest to see who will be the next chairman now that he's retired. I have no idea how this is going to proceed, but Lord knows I am interested to see how this story progresses. Next week will be my final Hunter Hunter review until the current arc is complete, so for now, rest up, catch up, and I'll see you all next week for my final Hunter Hunter review, the Succession Contest arc.
the impression Jing has given me is just what an insufferable jerk. <laughs> I mean, I really don't like him. I get my representation through the humble Leorio.